So good morning once again. I want to thank you all for your presence, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, for our international conference in defense of democracy. This is the third panel whose theme is alternatives and paths in the fight for the defense of democracy. Yesterday we had a very productive day. This is the last uh, session of our conference. I want to say thank you to our speakers. Without further ado, we're going to start. We will have 15-minute um, presentations from our speakers, and then we will open up for uh, brief remarks, comments, questions, and then we'll hand back to our speakers. So we are going to start with Virgilio Hernandez, please. So former member of Congress and former minister in Ecuador from the Citizens' Revolution Movement. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. I also want to send a special greeting, a spe special greeting for our president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, a special greeting from, Brazil, from Ecuador, from Latin America, a special greeting to you. So when they talk about alternatives and paths ahead for defending democracy, as the title for this workshop, has many implications. So we talk about alternatives and paths in, for defending democracy, and the title itself, there are two elements that are implicit. On the one hand, what is put to us is that democracy is under threat, and so we must defend it. There is a need to defend it. On the other hand, at the same time, they're telling us that in any way this democracy is not everything that we want. So we need to build alternatives to this democracy. Why? Because we are not in agreement with democracy in this concept, and so we seek to enrich it, to bring new elements to this democracy. Even though this would seem to be two contradictory things, perhaps this has to do precisely with the tasks we have at hand. So what is it that we have to defend? We have to have clarity about that. What is it that we need to defend? And at the same time, what alternatives we should put forward to the peoples? So we must defend right now, and perhaps this is the first task of revolutionaries, what we consider the minimum, the bare minimum, what Jorge Tayana yesterday was saying and summarizing as the debate that existed in the 60s between the formal democracy and substantial democracy. This is a debate that we thought we had overcome. And among progressive sectors, among the left, especially after the recent decades, that is a, a, a debate that is that has that is clear. In other words, we've, it's become clear that once we achieve government, when we achieve office, it's possible to change the balance of forces and achieve improvements for the people. What's the problem? This is no longer a question of discussion between revolutionaries and reformists as it was in the past, between a conservative project, right-wing project, that now wants to play the game in a terrain that they consider their own pitch. So for conservative sectors, traditionalist sectors, the 
space of democracy was its terrain, and we into, we went into their terrain, into their football pitch, and we won the game. Now they want to take part in this terrain, but eliminating the number of competitors, particularly if the political projects that we uh, had and were able to use them to win elections and govern without the major power groups. So yesterday we were asking ourselves, why are progressive governments being so fiercely combated? In the case of Ecuador, in the government of Rafael Correa in the 10 years, they didn't, the, 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 the business sectors kept on profiting. Banks were making money because we regulated the banking sector. And when we regulated the banking sector, the citizenry started trusting the banking sector again and putting their money into the banks. And to have once again the citizenry won out. And so what's the difference and why do they fought us? Because they didn't have a minister of finance that they could call on the phone and would do whatever the bankers wanted. They didn't have their own government, their own ministers, because they didn't depend on the phone calls of these uh, power groups, economic power groups, but rather on a people's mandate. So we have to have clear about what it is that we defend, because we know that this idea of defending the minimum is not among something that we fight between different progressive sectors. So, But fundamentally, the right doesn't want processes in which we participate, we the progressive sectors participate, and they're doing their best to eliminate us, if not through coups, then through other mechanisms. So this compels us to defend the rules of the democratic game. It's incredible that today, at the end of the second decade of the 21st century, we have to go back to saying what we thought was the minimum 40, 30 years ago. But it is necessary to defend the rules of democratic game, not as a procedural or instrumental thing, but a formative um, part of our democracy. It's possible in the second decade of the second decade of the 21st century that the justice system is controlled by mafias essentially and interfere in the electoral process that prevent the, the main candidate uh, for a presidential office in a country such as Brazil is not only prevented from standing but is arrested. So now there's no doubt that progressive sectors uh, deepen their democratic vocation. On the other hand, the right wants to triumph without having to fight elections at all. In the case of Ecuador, they blocked us politically. So for 10 years, we won 14 elections in succession, our movement. We were not allowed to register for the elections. So there were three parties that were prevented. They prevented us from registering with three different party names. So in 30 days before the elections, we got two million uh, signatures. They again prevented us from prevent from presenting the the. Uh, the signatures, whereas only 200,000 were necessary. We got 2 million, but we were prevented from registering them. So the elections that happened uh, were not democratic. In other words, the main political force in the country was marginalized, was prevented from taking full part in the electoral process. So it's an imperative, a democratic imperative, defending the rules of the democratic game. It's clear from the democratic perspective. What do we seek? They want elections. They can't say they don't want elections, but there's an important element for us. They want elections, once again, without selection. 
So they want elections, but they don't want the citizenry to, ch to choose between different projects. They want just variations of the same theme without profound change, and they want to legitimize the most procedural aspect, which is the respect for the people's will. If they can leave you outside the electoral competition, they do that. And if it's not enough, they stage a coup like the case or of Brazil, Honduras, Paraguay. They, they stage a coup. 20, 30 years ago, it would have been impossible without, without civil wars or dictatorships. But now they're able to do it because there's a new element in the democracies which is operated by power groups that are outside of governmental control. These are uncontrolled powers. They are the media powers and the communication networks, which act politically, take part in politics, but do it uh, irresponsibly. Not morally speaking, but because they just respond. So every power must be controlled, and the formal powers are controlled. Are, be con are controlled among themselves, but the communication media, the major media outlets, they carry out, they do the politicking, but they do it irresponsibly in the sense that they don't have to be accountable to anyone. So therefore, it's necessary to defend the most basic things, which are the role, the rules of the democratic game, the most basic of all. So. So defending due process, that's a fundamental task. The cases of all the progressive leaders, they forgot, so called, quote unquote, forgot due process. In our constitution is enshrined in Article 76. So Article 76 was filed away, literally. It is not abided by, so there's no presumption of innocence, and above all, that everybody should be treated until as innocent until proven guilty. So more than once, people have been tried for the same supposed uh, crime, and so various activities against the Constitution. There's a, la a lack of, there's a, a non-proportion between the punishment for the crimes that were uh, supposedly committed. There is no use of preventive arrests, not as the last res resource, but as the first, as the last resort, but as the first, as a way of keeping people outside of the electoral game. So it's an attempt to change the correlation of political forces, which is they're not able to do through the political system. So if Lula hadn't been arrested, he would have been president. So using the judiciary uh, has completely changed the political game. So these um, shell democracies uh, are completely changing the political landscape. That is the task, therefore, of progressive and revolutionary forces, making sure democratic rules are abided by. So all, they are also to defend all the social advances that were part of the, that were enshrined in the legislation and in the constitutions. We must defend those necessarily. The whole economic model that has been put forward in these constitutions, because they are the, the the summary, the synthesis of the aspirations of the democratic and progressive sectors who were that were uh, put forward for decades, ended up being enshrined in the constitution. Therefore, it's very important to defend democracy constitutions. This integral aspect of the rights, so all the rights have equal importance and equal value and must be defended equally. So I'm running out of time. I'm just going to mention alternatives that we'll be able to discuss these afterwards in the Q&A. So just mention a few alternatives. I think right now, if there are things to defend, there are also alternatives that we must raise. Perhaps something that the 
progressive uh, sectors had disdained a little bit, which is perhaps important to discuss the political regime of our peoples. Maybe, maybe that's not too crazy. So 30 years ago, we stopped discussing parliamentarianism, presidentialism, or other, another type of political regime that reflects this idea of participative democracy. Perhaps it's important to to discuss how we build our parties and new technologies of information and communication allow us to be in contact with the citizenry, not once a year or two or three or four years, but on a daily basis. So digital democracy has to begin in our movements and parties and has to be extended to our forms of interaction with society. We need to, uh, so quote unquote, to citizenize the Constitution. I've mentioned a few things about our Constitution. Who do we trust with our Constitution? The courts, the constitutional courts that haven't been able to um, guard minimally, to be the gatekeepers of our democracy. No, the people have to defend the Constitution only if the people uh, embrace the Constitution as their own. This is a task that regards, that requires discipline and constant contact with the people. We need to not fear the people and permit the broadest organization of social movements. We need to unleash the creative forces of our people to be able to combat fake news, all the media avalanche that is uh, uh, thrown up by the social networks. We need to build our unity, but above all, we need to recover the trust of the people that voted up for us in the past and through this media avalanche feels that we have defrauded them. So we have to build a narrative about corruption because this corruption is a part of the integral part of the system, of the processes of accumulation, and therefore it's crucial that we uh, cease to have a defensive position. So basically I want to say that we don't have, we don't have responses. We don't have ready-made answers. We have uh, possibilities of searching and then finding answers to be able to de demonstrate and to be uh, up to the challenges, the expectations of our peoples and knowing that progressive governments are not just history. They are the present and the future of our peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virgilia Nandes. Now I'm going to turn the floor to Maite Mola, that is Vice President of uh, the Left uh, uh, Wing Party in Europe. Good morning. Good morning, President Lula. Good morning, Dilma, President. First of all, uh, I think it's very important to say something I hadn't included in my speech today, but I would like to thank deeply the organizer of, of this event. Uh, yesterday, the political debate was very impressive, but even more so the organization that you had. I think that uh, uh, I think, though, I'm sure that the way you are working will certainly lead to a change in Brazil. And I'm certainly supporting you with that. What's happening you, in Latin America is not a nice isolated issue. We have the economic war, what is going on in Ukraine, the violence in Nicaragua, Venezuela, uh, the hardening of blockade measures against um, uh, Cuba the influence of China in the Philippines, the increase of militarism in Japan, the disregard of the Western frontiers of, the, of Russia. So all that has to do with a plan. Imperialism wants to gain the terrain that was lost and avoid a counterpower to raise. And they want to to put uh, scientific uh, natural resources to 
the, in the hands of a minority. There are two elements that are relatively new that we should analyze, however. On the one hand, the use of the police or the policial apparatus as a core service to the hands of the powerful. And we can see that as an example in Brazil, Argentina, uh, Ecuador, and also in Spain. And therefore, with that, you are contributing to a radicalization of the situation, which is basically the best way for the coming of ultra-right or far-right forces. And the objective is not only to prevent that leaders as Lula can take part in elections. The objective is to turn the left-wing criminal, the social movements criminal, our ideas criminal. And there is a whole generation of leaders that had the illusion, that had taken illusion and hope to millions of people that have been penalized by a capitalism system. We have uh, to, to suppose that during left-wing governments, we are not able to assess uh, the importance of uh, making use of police apparatus. In some cases, they had already been created in dictatorship periods, even in Spain. Franco uh, is dead, but the police is still connected to these forces. Likewise, in other moments, police academies were preparing the armies of Latin America to go on with the operations that went cut. So also the judicial party in the academy, they should be the arm for the application of the Mogram doctrine. That is the subordination of Latin America and the Caribbean to the United States. On the other hand, that has to do with uh, what our comrade just said. We have a mediatic offensive that tries to twist reality to make the population more confused, introducing neoliberal conservative values, particularly intolerance and also cosmisms that uh, are the desires of capitalism. The media is quite tolerant to the fascist uh, aspect of uh, far-right uh, forces so that they can be accepted naturally and even with some sympathy for those that will suffer the political consequences. That is a form of dividing peoples, including uh, an increase in equality, racism, and the divisions about among people, putting an end to feminism after so many years of struggle. So we have a challenge, but the idea is to have a collective response from workers, from society, so that this plan is counterposed by a plan that is developed by the people that should be developed in a collective manner to try to encompass the importance of regional integration processes. As we mentioned yesterday, plans have to be horizontal, they have to be based on solidarity, and they cannot, as it's happening in the European Union, to be based on economic exploitation. They have to be based on cooperation and mutual benefits. For this construction, it is very important to have a leading role in united spaces where political union social forces can all work for a common good. We have to highlight the importance of the Sao Paulo Forum and the proposals that came out from it. More concretely, the consensus of America, because it brings the elements for this counteroffensive. And in Europe, we have a complement there that is based on consolidation. But it is so far from getting there. 
Therefore, we need a plan that has to be favorable to action and thinks of an alternative, social and political alternative, with the minimization of social conflicts. And why? Well, because only then, only can we activate social conflict is when people can get to victories, and only then. So we have the challenge of adding forces, energies, and bring answers to the problems of humankind. At the same time, we have to design concrete proposals. My objective is socialism or communism in my particular case, but also concrete answers. In short, we have to focus on the building of a socialist society. And that's why we are here. While millions of European citizens are suffering the attacks of the capital, as you know, in the last uh, demonstrations that we are having in France, we have more economic and worker pressures. But we see people are fighting. Macron is going through a problem in France. And we, women, last year were able to organize in several countries, even in part of Latin America, a very interesting initiative. We are trying to follow the steps of uh, Hugo Chavez, Fidel Castro, and Lula started to take in the beginning of the 90s. We have elections for the European Parliament, and that will certainly bring change. Not only for good, because you know the far right forces are progressing. It is crucial for us to work all together and that we say clearly that another way is possible, a way of progress, inclusion, democracy, peace, and respect for men and women. We know that we have many things in common and that we have our differences. We don't deny differences. But the objective is to make differences, not to interfere in the development of a common good. That is, having a milestone that can offer political, social, union, and civil forces the opportunities by means of common points have a common good and putting together forces to change things. Central things are going to be discussed. I'm going to talk briefly about them. We have to have a new model of economic social development. I'm not going to say much, but we have to promote gender equality, which is fundamental and is also something that is going not only to separate us from far right, but also from the right. We have the obligation of working at an international level. For next March, we are able to hold an important strike of women worldwide, and that this is a spread. It is crucial. We have to have a personal effort to work this issue. Collective safety is very important. Trump's policies are pressuring the whole of Europe, not only here in your background, but in the whole of the world. We have to work also on the issue of migration that is strongly connected to economic, ecological issues, and also we have to focus on democracy and popular sovereignty. The main model that describes the operation of European Union is how frail the democracy is. And I'm being nice to it. I'm saying that democracy in Europe is ultra frail, not to say other things. And that is a threat to good and citizenship. Our objective is to fight for an Europe that is Europe. I'm talking, talking about European 
unit. I'm talking about the peoples of Europe. Fight for a democratic Europe full of solidarity and equality. And to close, it's very important to keep the left united and bring together those segments that are not considered leftist, but rather progressive, and also recover the concept of internationalism. This is fundamental, and it has to be an instrument of people to defend from aggressions. So it's not just a matter of solidarity um, towards one another, which is good, but also to understand that we are in the same fight. In Latin America, the imperialistic regime wants to close a cycle that was open with Fidel, Cristina, Chavez, Lula, and so I would tell you this. We have to know clearly that the role of the state is to ensure a fair distribution of income. But for that, we have to control strategic sectors of economy, electric, electric telecommunications, water and etc. to avoid company boycott. And I'm thinking of Venezuela now because that provokes a reaction and then the lack of supply of basics to the population. Again, a threat to democracy. We have to have mechanisms of participation of the people, that is, from representative to participative democracy. Now I'm really concluding. The situation is difficult and complex. Imperialism is attacking, but we are not defeated as long as we continue to fight. And then there is room for hope. We have to learn from our mistakes and should not feel defeated or isolated. We have to continue our social struggle, move towards journalism, and think of union. Because if we are not united, we are defeated. Lula Livre. Thank you, Maite Mola. Now I'm going to turn the floor to Giacomo Filibecchi, Vice General Vice Secretary of the Socialist Party in Europe. Thank you, Rosana. Thanks for the invitation of PT. Thanks, Monica Valente. Uh, thanks because it is an honor to be here with you and to be sitting next to a monument of uh, female leadership in the world, that is Dilma Rousseff, a monument. I'm not worthy uh, to be here, and I'm not worthy uh, to speak this beautiful language.
Thank you. I would like to begin by greeting our dear Hosanna Hamos coordinating this panel, Giacomo Filibeck, and thank him for his kind words about me and to say something, something very interesting. When I arrived in the Chidadenches prison, where we ended up going, I hope he understands. So when I arrived at the prison, it said on the wall, some prisoner had written. There were about five layers of paint, and it said, happy is the people that has no heroes. And that stayed in my mind. Why, why should people not have heroes? It was a kind of uh, a letting off steam. So happy is the people that doesn't have to resist the torture, that doesn't have to res resist restrictions of rights, all the atrocities that, that are committed over the course of history. So therefore, you don't need heroes, right? So uh, all the abuses against the poor and the oppressed, unlike what it seemed, it was a defense of the capacity of each of the people the anonymous people of resisting. People are not born resisting. The circumstances, historical circumstances, compel them to resist. And what is happening with all of us? This is something that we share at this moment in a very similar way. Why? Because we are experiencing a moment where all over the world globalization has led to an increase of development of capitalism where finances end up dominating. So the crises have become slower uh, when it comes to the recovery. The recovery from crisis has slower. So this has led to the opposite of what happened during the phase of liberal democracy, which is an enormous increase in inequality. And the whole ideology of social mobility in the post-Second World War period is coming apart because of such a rapid increase in inequality globally, particularly because finances, the financial sector, is dominating the economy, leading to a reduction, a dramatic reduction of productive investments therefore compromising also the uh, job creation and opportunities, harming workers, small business people, small uh, farmers, and even those that produce for the domestic market and don't have the dimensions, the scale to transform part of their companies into banks. This process explains this extreme inequality of loss of what you called the hypothesis that always my children will have a better life than I had. This led to a problem regarding democracy itself. So democracy is, seems to be mitigated. We are not uh, witnessing, we're not living through the democratic expansion of the post-war period after the 80s, both with Reagan and Thatcher. There was a change through brutal deregulation of the financial system, changed the conditions under which uh, profits are appropriated. And then you see those 
demonstrations of 1% against the 99. What Oxfam says, the world, the Brazil, the United States, and England, and any other country, an increase, a huge increase in, in the wealth of a very few number of people, and based on papers, treasury bills, bonds, um, and speculation, and reduction of jobs and more precarious work, and work becoming more precarious. This, in a certain way, was mitigated to a certain extent in Latin America by people-oriented governments, because while this process was taking place, we were distributing wealth on the continent, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Uruguay, in various countries, right? Some more than others, but most countries were going through this phase, this stage, which led to the con this process, which led to the 2008 crisis, started demonstrating a major problem because when governments are not able to meet social demands, they become gradually not explicitly, but they, they make part of politics become irrelevant to people. So people identify the lack of capacity of meeting their demands by politics. They identify a deterioration of politics in that. So from the ideological point of view, there also emerges on the cultural point of view, and very much manipulated by the mainstream media, a intensification, a radicalization of the traditional forms of explaining reality, which is to explain it through appearances only, the appearance of things. So it's... it's crazy that the migrants, like the Mexicans or Central American migrants, are, are called to account for the concentration of wealth in the biggest economy in the world, when in fact um, the owners of country, of, of the when the leaders of the business and the concentration of wealth uh, is completely to blame when many people are paid in stock options and so people speculate with their own stocks to raise their own wealth. So even Apple that has more than $800 billion a year of profits, they borrow to be able to speculate with their own stock. Because we know the profitability of third-party capital is always a lesser demand. That is, you can have a lower profitability than what you have with your own capital. So it's a brutal process of income concentration. And then why Trump? Why Brexit? Why the growth of the far right? Well, to a certain extent, we are in a period of transition. I do not think we can explain internationally what Gandhi says, that the new was not born and the dead uh, has not died. It's like the serpent, uh, as uh, old people lose their skin. Today, we have a different skin. It's not the industrial capital. The skin is a financial capital. It's a brand new skin that started to form since the 80s and is now maturing. It's a process. I think we do have a serious problem uh, in liberal democracy. And I agree. Liberal democracy to us in the left uh, Latin America parties. It's, no, it's not just liberty 
of uh, organization. Uh, we, be, we made liberal democracy progressive in itself. And why? Because uh, it does not lose its validity with us. And then two things come up. We have uh, this incapacity to respond at the level of others, the demands of population. And then there is a devaluation of policy, politics. It is the means through which we have to see that the issue of inequality it is a product of people's reactions. I react against uh, migrants. They are taking my employment away. This is my immediate view. It's not the process of the system. It is how I see it. And I think this happens in some demonstrations as well. I'll give you an example. We had uh, a demonstration that is similar to the yellow vests in uh, France, which is a, a demonstration of truck drivers. Indeed, to increase the price of uh, gas by 400% is scandalous. And it turns uh, company owners uh, 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 to a problem. They don't know uh, what their costs are going to be. It's a problem to truck drivers that have their trucks. It's a problem to everyone. But the cause, is it the increase of price? What leads to an increase of price? Well, what leads to an increase of price is the submission of an administration to the interest of a minority that controls the financial shares of uh, Petrobras. And instead of rendering accounts to the collective, renders accounts to a minority. So the demonstration becomes against the increase of the kitchen gas, of oil. In France, it is against uh, taxation. I think it's very important to diversify the energy matrix. But the problem in France is not diversification of energy. It is, like in any European country, the loss of rights that they are trying to impose to workers. And it comes to a point, it's just too much. And when it is too much, there is a movement that comes back and stands out and is transformed and becomes a movement that rejects politics uh, many times. And why? Because the political dequalification process started back then. We went through that. So we have to discuss how we can have, uh, I'm sorry, what forms of democracy are replacing liberal democracy, some call mitigated uh, democracy. Others talk about a state of exception that corrodes democracy from inside. So you have several categories and several manifestations of democracy. Here in Brazil, we have experienced in uh, recent years, since the coup of uh, 216, a process of uh, the building of a new order. Uh, um, I, I don't know what to call it, but I think it is a state of exception, that is, a state that lives together with democracy but corrodes democracy from inside. It's not like a military dictatorship that we have already experienced, where you have a full elimination of rights, the right to, to demonstrate, the freedom of press, organization. You have a general loss to everyone in any circumstance. This is a military dictatorship or a dictatorship. What is the difference from what we are going through? Why people say it's not a coup? Because a coup 
evidences and uh, discloses, strips a taking an undue taking of power. So they cannot call it coup because uh, unlike uh, previous coup, remember, um, they seized uh, t uh, the TV or radio communications and it said this is how it's going to be from now on. So coups in the past were evident. This one is disguised. A coup to democracy right now is something has to be under a veil. So I will say we have to have a more extreme democratic fight that matches the emergence of neoliberalism. We cannot only be only Democrats. You have to remember that in Brazil, it started with my impeachment, and then it started with, and then with, went on with an adoption of national sovereignty and a neoliberal uh, economic practice, and then it culminated with the arrest of Lula because he was going to win the elections. So you have three stages to prepare for a new order. Uh, Lula could not win the elections for a simple fact. The whole system of the coup had to reproduce. If Lula won the election, he would prevent the reproduction to follow. He would prevent uh, Petrobras to be sold, that uh, workers would continue to lose rights because they are saying the labor reform is still incomplete. The passing of the pension reform, the school without parties, the independence of our central bank, and so on. Lula could not win the election, and he was winning the elections. They did everything for him not to win. First, he was uh, prosecuted, then he was convicted, then he was prevented from being a candidate. He was arrested. He was prevented from speak out. And all this process just uh, moves on and uh, gets to its apex in an election. And uh, uh, not all will consider that in Brazil we have uh, a new fascist authoritarianism that uh, raised to power. And why? Because there is an articulation of new liberalism, but there is a component there which is the following. It's no use just to defeat your opponents in an election because, you know, this is the democratic game. You know, part of the democratic game is to run an election and win or lose it. But, you know, just destroy your opponents is not part of the democratic game. And they don't want it. They don't want political opponents. They don't want uh, rights to the population. So this is what is going on in Brazil. And why do I talk about taking democracy more radically, which is the most important thing to us? Because I believe that democracy is uh, uh, taking democracy to the extreme is the way of putting together the populational side of social rights, defending your sovereignty, because in our countries, we have to know where our wealth is going to, where everything we build goes to. And we build in different realms. I'm not talking only about our natural resources or fertile land, but also all the technology we developed to build a medium-sized jet in Embraer, 
uh, there is a technology behind that, and now they want to sell those that produced uh, medium-sized jets uh, competed with Bombardier and Boeing, and now they want to sell to Boeing. This is our technology. You can share. I'm not against having partnership, but why sell it away? The same applies to the fact that we are a country that uh, learned and got, expert, uh, got the expertise of uh, exploiting oil in deep um, waters in high temperature. Why do we have to hand in our wells? Oh, Petrobras does not have the money. How come Petrobras does not have the money? Any bank in the world will want to lend money to an oil company. So we are going through times where there's, there's much at stake. And democracy is a way through which we have to manifest ourselves and take things to the limit. It's a whole process of uh, fights. And I think, and I would like to close with that, there is another uh, very important piece of news here, uh, in addition to the emergence of the far right. And I think this is news at the international level. And I'm talking about the so-called new media. I don't think the new media is neutral. Uh, we don't say uh, television or radio uh, communication is neutral. Uh, new media uh, is technology that can be used in different ways. We witnessed in this last election a disruptive aspect of uh, media, and I'll talk about that further on, with regards to Brazilian elections. For the same time, those that did not uh, have time uh, in television, didn't, did not uh, uh, debate, could win elections. How come a party that had no time on TV, that did not go to debates, won the election? How come? Because there was a new political ground through the new media. In the United States, it was through Facebook. Here, it was WhatsApp. What is disruptive? Disruptive is any technology that enters a system and puts an end to something. I'll give you an example. I am uh, from a time in which we used to that gadget, I don't even remember, remember its name. Instead of watching Netflix or Prime Video, whatever, we had a tape, a tape. The other day, I saw a vinyl record. I am from the time where I listened to music from vinyl records, uh, children's tales. You are younger than I am. I know technology is disruptive. And what I'm saying is that social media, politically speaking, creates a new ground. In the case of WhatsApp, it's even more complicated because this ground, you have a bilateral relationship. That is, you don't have uh, a collective dialogue and if there is no dialogue then you allow for a level of expansion of a ground in which we were not present and this is going on throughout the world it's not only in Brazil a strong presence of the social media in the process I do believe Taking democracy to an extreme has also to go through the social media as a form of interaction. We need it to be able to expand the process, especially 
uh, we that in Latin America uh, are going to have a difficult time ahead of us. And it's going to be very important to have articulations at different levels. We cannot do away a major democratic popular front. Uh, we cannot do away with it. So I would like to close by saying that I think it would be very timely for all movements, parties, organizations, conglomerates to fight uh, for what we called left in the past, and now it's more uh, in the ground of uh, being progressive. And we have to modernize uh, this ground and make it again a ground that can attract millions of people, youngsters, and workers using this media. We'll have to use it because here in Brazil, workers use the media on strikes. I remember the strikes involving uh, workers from hydropower plants and always as a mechanism for the call of the strike of the truck drivers. The yellow vests did the same. So it's not something that we cannot think is not here to stay. The use of social media in political social movements is here to stay. We either embrace it or we are going to become just bureaucratic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President, for your words. Now we are going to open for your questions. Remember, the topic of this panel is alternative impacts in the fight in defense of democracy. And we are going to prioritize those that did not uh, speak up yesterday. So we had uh, a small accident here on uh, our table. We knocked down four glasses of water. OK, uh, please do take your seats so that we can resume so that we have more time for those that uh, uh, subscribed. We have 10 people. The panel will ask you to keep two minutes 
at the most so that we can hear everyone and then get back to the panel. The first is going to be Roy Baza. Roy? Okay, the mic is here with Reiko. Can you introduce yourself? I want people to introduce themselves. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to take part. I'm Roy Dasa of the Socialist United Socialist Party of Venezuela. I am a Chavista, in other words. So I want to say the following. Firstly, so the discussion about democracy in our country that, that had a very specific role here, in our view, is very important. If it weren't for the democratic principles that we have uh, sustained over the whole time that we've been harassed as a country, uh, democracy in Venezuela would have been replaced by the same people who in April of 2012 set up the recent the dictatorship in my country. In 47 hours, they were defeated with the unity, the national unity of all the political forces, social forces that said that used democracy as an example for Latin America and the world. So we do not have the view that some people can't understand the depth and the importance, the significance that has the process, the political process, democratic political process in Venezuela. That's it. Thank you, Roy. Your credential. If you brought your credential here, you're going to get it back a little wet, okay? Maybe be careful before putting it back onto your neck. Dirce. Dirce Corrado Vega. After Dirce Blanca Flora. Please uh, get ready. Good morning. Dirce Vega. I live in Rome and Italy. I brought my son. Uh, for him to speak, to say something. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, President Dilma. It's an honor to be here. The, the Comitato, the Lula Libre Committee in Italy has been bought, has been created to defend democracy in Brazil for the freedom of President Lula. Uh, unlike what a lot of Brazilians say, we Brazilians abroad continue our strike for democracy in Brazil and for Lula's freedom. I want to make the most of this opportunity to ask the foundation, the organization of the Workers' Party, Clarice Miller, for promoting the event on the 14th of December in Italy. So the right to democracy in Brazil in the International Women's Center. Vice President Manuela Davila, candidate, will be there. The idea is to help us organize our resistance in both countries. I believe that when there is a civil war, which happened here in nearly every country in our continent, it's easy to differentiate who is in one side and who is in another side. But in a political struggle where there's no war, it's difficult sometimes for the peoples to identify who is in one side and who is in the other, because the media 
uh, wage uh, campaign of the oligarchs and bourgeois and the social movements and the left-wing parties, even though we have some uh, of our own media, we don't have the same capacity to reach the whole of the people. So I think it's very important to talk about a bourgeois democracy and a workers' democracy. There's President Rousseff is here, so if we're talking only about democracy in generic terms, we're contributing to the confusion. So we are in a class struggle. That is, this is a term that is not so much used. We talk about civil society and business sectors are so abusive that they go into these groups of so civil society organizations when in fact we know that they are the owners of power of the means of production, the, the majority. And when they have the economic power, they are able to arrive at every home through the mass media. So let us also take up again the concepts that some people are no longer uh, valid. So this idea that there are no longer social classes, at least in El Salvador, many people say that there are no more social classes. And so we have to re take up again these concepts in the relationship with our peoples. And so there are two elements. In Brazil, it's very clear that President Lula had a model, economic and social model, to empower the people. But when this was seen and it started having an influence uh, internationally, this is not tolerable for the empire and for the oligarchs of our countries to have a labor leader as president of the republic. So I have every respect, respect and admiration for the struggle for his freedom. Thank you, Blanca. Good morning. In the name of the Socialist Party of Peru, a greeting to the organizers and our panelists. We're here to join this International Day of Action for Lula's Freedom. Let us not forget that we are experiencing an exceptional situation. There is a buildup of wealth as never before. Poverty that exists in the world today is the fruit of inequality, not of scarcity. Second thing, there are questions that we need to put ahead of others. The f issue of free migration before free trade. And secondly, the role of democracy. We have to uh, take on the liberal Republican democracy with all its defects and mistakes as a form that to us, not as a, as a path or as a shortcut, but actually a, a, a means that we as socialists must uh, defend constantly. And so equality for human beings and defense of the earth. Patricia Valin, and then Ivanildo de Dios. I'm a professor of the Federal University of Bahia. I'm part of I'm part of the Besso Abramo Foundation's uh, Consultative Council. I'm going to tell a brief story about possible paths of resistance, not only in Brazil and in 1798, a group of black and mixed race, uh, poor men raised in rebellion, and many things that they were asking were to the access to water to be because at the time the access to water was controlled by the landowners 
And this, they would, the estates would often be on the riverbanks, and so there was no access to water if you were not liked by the landowners. So these men wanted to be able to have to be politics. So they write, they wrote bulletins. And, calling for revolution. After one year, they were hung and quartered. It's called the, the history of Brazil is very ironic because they were hung and quartered in the square called the Square of Piety, of mercy, rather. So this idea of water is very different from the south and the northeast. In the Lula and Dilma governments, the impact of policies are not the same in the northeast and in the southeast of Brazil. The northeast is the poorest part of, of Brazil. We have a program called Cisterns for All with one and a half million cisterns that ensured what we called in Bahia in other parts of the northeast that was a revolution because it allowed the empowerment of women of black population who are mothers who raise their children by themselves. My point is, men who condemned, the men of 1798 who were uh, hanged is a family that arrived in Brazil with Tomé de Souza and their descendants are today in the in the prosecution service of Paraná. So they are in, in Brazilian politics since 1548. My point here is to say thank you that it's not possible to have resistance or any kind of radical democracy opposing barbarism if we continue doing here in the Southeast, making agreements that harm the Northeast. So in the Northeast, we have a, a belt of progress, of progressivism, of governments to the left, above all because of the positive impacts of Lula's policies in our part of the country. This is what I would like to propose that we should discuss. There are many uh, legacies of the Lula government, but also of the inheritance of slavery that influences still, still today uh, part of our uh, middle and upper class. Ivanildo and then Andy. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, President Lula. I want to talk about two different points in Brazilian history. The Vargas era, which was 30 to 45, when Brazil was able to achieve for the first time in its history uh, international recognition, particularly uh, regarding it's uh, the start of oil uh, processing in Brazil. And the Lula era, when there was a process of development, where the economy, so Vargas discovered oil, and Lula discovered the pre-salt uh, oil deposits. So after the Second World War, the Lula the, era hadn't, the, 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 the Vargas era had already ended, and there was a, imperialist project to prevent Brazil's development. This imperialist project wanted to transform Brazil into a neo-colony. We had only 19 years of democracy, 1945 to 1964. And since the 88 constitution, or, or, we also had a very brief democratic period from 1988 to 2016 when President Dilma was unfairly uh, unseated. So what I want to say is that with the state of exception or whatever it is that they've created in our country, there is a project, a permanent project of colonialism because the United States cannot stand and have never stood 
a country, a sovereign country of, in Latin America, such as a country such as Brazil, in Latin America, with an independent with independent policies. So the Brazilian elites are at the mercy, continue to be arms of the United States and all the capital, international capital. So we cannot at any moment think in alliances with the right in Brazil because they have always historically um, benefited from us and we have to be firm from now on in the struggle for our country to be truly a sovereign country and developed country and above all there's no democracy without people's participation this dictatorial democracy as was said yesterday doesn't exist we have to stay firm and the struggle has to be forever has to be in unity we have to fight with firmness to be able to transform our country in a truly sovereign and developed country where the people participate in politics Lula we're gonna gonna, gonna get you out of there old, old man Randy and then Walter My name is Wendy Muse. I'm from the United States. Forgive my country, please. <laughs> I have a question for President Dilma, but it's more or less been asked. She's giving an interview. Reading the 2018 election results, it seems that the votes and the pockets uh, are very similar. So richer people voted for the right. So people earning twice the minimum wage also voted for him. So my question is for President Dilma. So she's always been an activist her whole life. Miu fought in the streets, so understands the spirit of the left. So I want how the left in Brazil and the Workers Party in particular can find once again and preserve the spirit of the left and what are the plans and concrete measures to recapture the groups that the left has lost particularly as well as the social medias and these virtual things I think people have to have to contact with people face to face so what are the plans and measures for the future for the next election considering everything that is happening in the cities thank you Walter Poma and Pedro Paulo Bastos Good morning, everyone. There are many questions that were raised here, such as this discussion about the relationship between industrial capital, financial capital, the comparison of the truckers in Brazil and the yellow vests in, in France, the Democratic People's Front, etc. But something that what Virgilio said I think Ecuador is a case that should be debated very much among us because there was no coup there and there wasn't an electoral victory of the right. We won the election with Lenin Moreno and then what happened? We won. Candidates supported by the left won. So it's a very interesting case. After he won, uh, what Virgilio related uh, happened. So it should be a debate that has been overcome by now. This debate between formal democracy of substantive democracy. So we beat the right in their own playing field. I think we won. Partly. We won in a few countries in Latin America, some of them very important, but not all. 
However, we transformed very little. Of course, we have to talk positively about everything that we did, but we didn't alter any structures of property or power in our countries. So much so that they used their property and their power that were left generally intact. They used them to take power back in most of the countries we govern in the region. So I don't think that it's clear that this debate between formal democracy and substantive democracy, or to speak in the language between I learned between bourgeois democracy and people's proletarian democracy, I don't think this debate has been exhausted. I think there's a, even a paradox there, which is we have not been able by the path of liberal democracy, arrive at socialism anywhere in the world. But the fascists managed to, to achieve uh, their aims through the liberal democratic instruments, not just here in Latin America, but in other parts of the world. The mechanisms of liberal democracy allow those that are anti-democratic freedoms, allow them to to gain office, to achieve office. So I don't agree that the defense of the rules of the game or democracy, liberal democracy, is our northern star. Where in the history of humankind was fascism developed within the rules of the game? Where? That's the question I, re I raise for the debate. Thank you, Walter. Pedro Paolo Lastos, and then Suplicy. I would like to thank the organizing committee, compliment uh, the international speakers. I think that the consensus that is coming out from here is that to, it is important to think of forms of participative democracy, not only for representative democracy to reflect uh, the people's consensus, but also in its very form, the way it conveys consensus is rooted in its substance uh, a long time. However, I think that perhaps we fail to discuss what uh, global governance is all about because many of the problems uh, that left-wing parties had in the last uh, 20, 30 years have to do with the limitations that were imposed in institutions that go beyond the democratic uh, space, many of them imposed by the US, and that gives uh, huge power to the international financial market. Considering that we are here gathering a set of leaders, representatives from left-wing uh, movements throughout the world, shouldn't we think of ways to reflect together on an agenda about the reforms we have to have for the international system, more specifically the economic governance and world globalization. Considering that uh, the Progressive International was created last week with significant uh, uh, participation of Benny Sanders in the heart of the empire of uh, international globalization. Thank you. Aparecido Araújo Lima will have the floor, and then Laurindo Leo Filho. Oh, I'm sorry. We have Suplicy before. I, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. He was already uh, online. Uh, my mistake. Oh, I'm Sidoni from the Consenting uh, Council. I'd like to ask a question about the yellow vests to everyone uh, in the panel. I don't know if you know, but Portugal is calling a demonstration 
already 41,000 people for the uh, 21st of December. There are already 41,000 people interested in taking part. I think that's a bit dangerous, and I would like uh, to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Suplicy, you have the floor. Okay, Laurindo then, and then Suplicy. Good morning, everyone. I would like to ask a question. President Dilma talked uh, 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 quite uh, rightly about the presence of WhatsApp as decisive in the Brazilian election process, especially in the last week and the last 12 days uh, in Brazil. But I think that was just an acute process. I think there is a chronic process that is even more important than that, that we are not paying much attention, which is uh, the process of the traditional electronic communication, and I mean radio and TV. For years, or always, Radio and TV have had public concessions uh, granted by the state, always thinking of uh, corporate interests. And they have been on the side of the dominant classes. In electoral processes, they are obviously sided to conservative parties. The chronic process developed by the traditional means of communication basically involves uh, a threefold function, criminalization of politics all the time, every day, uh, day to clock news criminalizes uh, politics. They don't, people don't even have to understand what Peter's saying, but uh, you know, they are in the restaurant, they are on the streets, and they are watching news criminalizing uh, politics. Then, police-like shows that use violence to respond to violence. Again, every day, people are afraid of leaving the streets, not only, not exactly for what happens on the streets, but what these police-like shows show on TV. And then the moral issue, radio and televisions in the hands of religious sects that again incorporate all the values that were used in the last electoral campaign in Brazil. My question, very straightforward, how can we, using the democratic tools that we have to do, how can we give voice to the population in traditional means of communication. That is, how to open public radio and TV stations that are free from the capital in Latin American countries. Thank you. Mariana from Canal Putra. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, President Lula. I would like to say I am from Purpura Channel, an alternative media. We devote our work to have a narrative that counterbalances the traditional journalism that monopolizes information, especially in times of an electoral campaign that is disputing power. As uh, President Dilma mentioned, I believe in the monopoly of these elections, not only WhatsApp, but uh, in the traditional media. Many people that uh, have been um, to university feel legitimate to say that the northeast of Brazil is illiterate and that doesn't know what politics is all about when in turn they were responsible for a horrendous coup. So we have to give voice to alternative media. Maybe we are not as uh, 
big as the traditional media, but we can have a counterbalance. In Guatemala, we saw people talking about using technology to fight dictatorship. And in dictatorship, they were talking about Dilma and Lula as if progressive parties were imposing and not inclusive. All of that just uh, to spread uh, far or ultra-liberal thinking that uh, only excludes uh, from the benefits those that had never had access to anything. So our Purpura channel wants to be with you in the fight for Lula Livre. Thank you, Mariana. Andresa. Two minutes. I would like to greet political leaders and say that the Brazilian experience is proof that it's not only getting to government or have a majority in Congress to guarantee a complete implementation of our project forces of the far right funded by capital seize sectors to prevent governability. The media, the judicial system, they are all committed to conservatism and corruption. And they have incited the population about uh, against the population in opposition to governments that are committed to the development of world macroeconomics. We can see this poor relations in oil. That is, an ascension to power can really create real damage to our organizations and our representatives. People are just disputing power and in pose the, the end of our project. They prevent us from acting. We have to try and operate deep changes in the way we work and to foster the work of the structures in which we are involved. We have to improve the quality of democratic participation so that we can spread critical thinking away from manipulation. Politics cannot be psychic in terms of winning and losing right or left. It has to accumulate lessons learned and avoid past mistakes. We have to have politics that is free from the humors of money. We have to reflect on how we can have participative democracy. With that, we are going to have a democratic identity. It is essential to improve the participation of our population by means of social movements. We have to create a network so that we can have different ways to mobilize and work at the population. We have to make decisions with collective groups so that we can get free of a model that has really repressed our operations. Thank you very much. Suplicy now. Two minutes. Good morning, President Lula. I have just uh, uh, hand in uh, President Dilma a gift uh, for her birthday with my greatest affection and solidarity to her. Uh, her birthday is next uh, Friday, uh, December 14th, and I gave her uh, the book that I consider is the most thorough about uh, why the basic income is going to be a crucial instrument to ensure freedom to everyone. 
the basic income is an extreme proposal for a free society and a healthy economy. And I want to tell her that I felt very much encouraged for her energy and her strength. Uh, both of us, Dilma and I, were leading the opinion polls to be elected senators. And in the final uh, um, stretch, in the last days, we were both uh, bombed by a cruel movement of the social media, especially WhatsApp, providing fake news about ourselves. I think that uh, still we'll need uh, uh, time to be considered by the electoral justice system because the volume of message was such that uh, it did not, uh, was such, but it didn't show in the accounts rendered by our opponents to the electoral justice. And the other day, I visited the uh, uh, second uh, most voted senator, Maria Gabili. We had a nice conversation. I gave her my book. Uh, we uh, had to, had in, uh, other interactions before when she was a federal representative and I was a senator. She uh, is an advocate of people with handicap, and I had uh, already had some projects uh, to this population. But anyway, in this talk, she was told by a representative of the uh, Jewish community, and uh, she heard of an entrepreneur that was connected to uh, Major Olimpo, the senator that had the most votes, that he had 20 million uh, messages being routed uh, to attack Mara Gabrilli. So if she received uh, 20 million negative imagined, uh, messages, I imagine how many myself and President Dilma had. We had seven senators, female senators, and now we are just going to have seven senators, male senators. We had 51 representatives, and now we are going to have 77. So that was a, a move forward. But President Dilma was the first woman who became a president. It was a huge advance. So all my support to President Dilma. She gave me the energy for me to continue with you fighting for Lula Livre and for a fairer Brazil. Thank you very much. Okay, we have concluded our contributions from the floor, remarks, questions, so we hand back to our panelists, I'm going to invert the order. President Dilma is giving a few interviews, so as soon as she's uh, able, she'll return to the panel. And at the end of the replies or the comments from our panelists, we will have a, a brief uh, closing uh, session with our comrade Monica Valenti. So I hand over to Giacomo Filibeck.
Thank you, Giacomo. Now I hand over to Maite Molla. Well, I have the opinion that many of the questions that were raised here are actually rhetorical because they are questions that we know the answer to. So it's a way of making sure that the panel and the different forces repeat, represented here, how they respond. So I'm going to accept the provocation. <laughs> So Erdogan won the demo elections democratically. I have doubts about that, Erdogan in Turkey, because the leader of the opposition is in prison. And I'm, I have an arrest warrant for me in, in, in Turkey because I raised the placard saying Erdogan is a thief. So I have problems with starting off from the assumption that Erdogan was elected democratically. Because the fact that he was voted for, does that mean you were voted, that people voted freely, that there were no influences? I have doubts about that. And I think that I'm very depressed to having to say this, because we're having to defend something that we don't truly believe in. We don't know if this democracy is actually liberal. And one detail, on Monday, yesterday, there was in Mahakesh a meeting of leaders of the countries, I think 160 countries, and we know to talk about migrations and immediately the, the Belgian government fell. It was made up of the right and the far right to be nice. So the far right asked the prime minister of Belgium asked him not to go to, to Marrakesh and the prime minister did go. So the government fell. So I have doubts about this democracy, whether we are able to accept the word. Maybe we can inv in invent another one. The second question, I think, and I'm going to be implacably self-critical, I think we have a problem with the concepts, not with the concepts, rather, with how we try to persuade people that there are social classes, that there is such a thing as class struggle that this type of conceptions that we are very clear about, that the far right explains it in an easy fashion. So the immigrant is the enemy because he takes your job away. You can't say in Spain, in Spain there are three million of empty homes and two million people that live in the streets. People understand it very well if you put it like that. We can say, why hundreds of thousands of youngsters have to leave Spain to, to find work? So the enemy is the boss, not the immigrant. So it's difficult to say class war, class struggle. We have to have to be clear about the messages we convey because the right is very smart. Marine Le Pen is great. I, I was in, in I was in Brussels. So I was in Brussels at the time during the French presidential election campaign, and she was great. She says, you've noticed, right, that people have different cultures. They eat different food. So there are very simple examples in each of our countries to be able to reach people and show the opposite view. So we, at the bottom of it is the class struggle and our, our uh, conceptions. So continuing the self-critique, we invest a lot of time and money in all the change of, of media. So we're not taking it seriously enough, the fight that we need to do, because that's not going to stop. 
we are still in the time and we have to keep it of putting posters up in the streets. I do believe that we have to go in the streets and give out leaflets and put posters up, but we have to be concerned within our organizations to prepare ourselves we have to be ready for this other arena of struggle. We have less money than the right, clearly, but there are radios, internet, there are a bunch of things that we can do as long as we devote time and money to it. And I think this is a fundamental analysis. Fourth point, regarding governance and treaties, that would be enough for a PhD thesis. But what I want to say, I am in favor of a regional model in Europe, as has been said, but a regional model like ALBA or CELAC, a regional model where the people can really have an opinion and have an input. So I don't have one in favor of a treaty of, of Euro, a European I'm not in favor of a European Union where the majority is imposed, made up of the right, impose what is to be done. I don't want to talk about the treaties with the US and Canada and with Latin America, with different countries in Latin America and Africa, who, which are treaties where the, the poor always poor lose out because they're only thinking about the multinationals. And to conclude, the yellow, the yellow vests. I was telling my friend who was in the audience. So last week, I went into a Facebook group of yellow vests in Brussels because I wanted to understand what they were doing. So I can assure you that 90% of the comments that are in this group that had 200 odd members last Thursday and now has almost 4,000. Most of the comments I could have made myself. They are comments. This cannot be the poor are always paying, the women are always paying the bill. So there were very few comments that sh shocked me and these people were kicked out of the group so what I want to say with this, let's not be afraid. There, there are movements out there. Logically, there are because there's a lot of poverty. So what should we as the left do? My opinion, my point of view, we have to get involved and not get there and say, I might be more of the left-wing party of Europe. No, I'm a worker. I'm a retiree. I have a bunch of problems. You talk to people, discuss, and one day if they ask you, you politically, yes, I'll, I'll tell you where I'm from, but we can't start the conversation with that. They've seen that I'm a member of the people. I'm one, one of them. I can talk about party politics later. So what Gramsci used to talk about hegemony, how do you build it? persuading people in every location, in every place. So after these critiques and self-critiques, as is the last thing that I'm going to say here, Lula Libre, and let the struggle continue, and let's take over the streets, otherwise we know that the others are going to take them over. Thank you, Maite. Now Virgilio Hernandez. I would like to approach some of the points that were raised today. We talked about many topics, but I'm going to choose three. Um, I'll start with the relationship established by President Dilma Rousseff when she talked about go extreme in democracy against neoliberalism. I was thinking about what Walter was saying about what is it that can make the difference in our uh, work. And I think there is a crucial point here that uh, Gustavo Ferreira from 
Argentina said. And uh, he mentions the difference between democ the democracy we want and the purely liberal democracy. And the difference there is the issue of equality. He says that uh, to govern is to equalize uh, people. And I think this is the topic we should focus on. Equality, and not equality in law, because uh, effectively the equality in law has already been established. As Maite mentioned, we cannot uh, admit a candidate that may win the elections to be arrested. So that's not democracy. We are going to soon have uh, elections in Ecuador, and when of uh, the main political forces does not have a complete record to be part. What kind of democracy is that? But there is even more than that. It's not only equality before the law. We have to think of societies that are more equalitarian. We have to recognize uh, even in the international arena, the administration of Korea made our population equal, uh, perhaps the most equal in Latin America. So we have to think of equality transgenerational. These generations cannot consume the resources of future generations. And then we have to think about that and reflect how can we use our resources better. How can we recognize, as we say in Constitution, that nature has also rights, which created a full range of debates according to our Constitution. Nature has rights, and our citizens can advocate for the rights of nature if they are threatened. And also thinking of the perspective of equality, which implies rethinking this idea that has been characteristic of liberal democracies, which is to mistake diversity with an uh, inequality. So, and that explains why women are treated uh, unequally, indigenous populations, the black. Historically, they have been unequal in our society. We have to bet on diversity, but we have to fight against inequalities. We have to set apart the idea that diversity is justification for inequality. So that seems to me a core topic, fighting for diversity, but against inequality. That should be a characteristic of ours. And when we think about this, it comes a second idea to me, how the fight for democracy can move on and how equality has to take us, and I, I agree with Walter here, uh, and maybe it was my mistake in explaining things. It's not only to respect the rules of the game, but how we can transform the rules more and more. Replanning based on the political regimen so that we can relate better to our movements and with our movements and the rest of the population. So not only to respect the rules of the game, but how can we turn the rules to be more and more uh, respectful to our citizens? We were talking to our friends in the Forum of Sao Paulo, and we said that neoliberalism is a topic that has to be really addressed today, because it's not only a comeback of liberalism. 
but the scumbag of liberalism has an ethical component attached to that. And that was is being put forward to our societies. So adjustment measures are justified because progressive uh, governments failed. That's what is said. Privatization is uh, son, shown as an alternative to better control of the government. They disregard our investments in health, in education. They talk about debt by disregard to what we invested to improve the population or the lives of our population. It seems that we have mortgaged our country which is not true. And then everywhere you hear in the streets that uh, you have to invest in a relationships with China. This is the argument for privatization. Privatization as a means for the need of resources that uh, we have spent. And this is what is explained to people. So it's not only a plan for economic adjustment. It is presented as an ethical response to what was done before, and a cultural response. So we have to answer back. And again, we cannot stay in the realm of the economic solutions, but we also have to go into the cultural, ethical side of it. As Walter said, and other companions already talked about, we have the media just saying every day in the news things that are bad to us. And again, this is criticism to us that we're part of progressive governments. Because we want to dem democracy more and more, the left wing and progressive are getting more and more convinced about democracy. The right is decreasing its inclusive capacity. And therefore, we bet on public media and not uh, the traditional media. We changed the law of communications in Ecuador to have uh, three thirds, one third for private, one third for public, one third for associations. But 94% of television and radio chains continue to be private. 5% are public and just 1% in the holds of uh, the social movements. And furthermore, today we have Facebook, we have Face, uh, WhatsApp that are not real networks. They are uh, uh, just unilateral communication, 20 million impulses. This is not an individual that devotes his time to sending messages. You have large conglomerates behind this communication. And we failed to face these tools. And uh, if we don't go there, we are going to be always fighting on uneven ground, completely uneven. And that's uh, what I would like to close you with. Today, we have to radicalize democracy. And that has to do with presenting to people alternative measures so that we can regain the trust people had on us and at the same time, expand the trust. And for that, we need new tools to engage into this cultural fight. Otherwise, the ground will never be equal, and we will not be able to get to those citizens that think that what they need is just a new cell phone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you very much, Giacomo, Matemola, and Virgilio Hernandez. Before turning to Monica, that is going to close the session, I would like to make an announcement. Comrades from the Curatorship Council of uh, Perseu Urbano Foundation. We have a meeting at 2 
in the room where we had the streaming yesterday. Just to the left when you leave this room. It's going to start at 2 o'clock. I would like to thank, on behalf of the management of the Perseo Amelino Foundation, our comrades and uh, translators and interpreters, the team of uh, the foundation and the international relations team. Um, I think Monica is going to say that. But each one of you contributed for us to conduct this activity with such huge success. So now I will turn to Monica, Secretary of International Relations, to close our conference. Thank you very much, Rosanna. I just have a, a few words to mention. I'm going to be quick. I was going to try to make an overall summary of all the topics that were raised yesterday in the two panels and today, and it's very hard to do that because of the complexity of teams on the one hand, but mainly because of the depth of the proposals and reflections that were conducted here these two days. Uh, in this regard, I would like to thank uh, dearly uh, Fundação Perseu Abrano to enable us to have these two days to uh, conduct uh, high-level reflections in a time of complexity, to understand what is going on, uh, a complexity of a multifaceted reality ahead of us, uh, and which demands this kind of reflection. Uh, so they are not ready-made reflections. They are not simple. There were many points of view, many contributions, many interpretations. And I believe that uh, before such complex world, with so many change challenges to our people and to humankind, if we are not able to have room to really sit down and reflect together, we won't be able to find answers. I think these two days gave us the means to ask the right questions, because for you to find answers in a confusing world, you have to ask the right questions. And Fundação Perseu Abreu enabled us to do that in these two days of debate. And secondly, I would like to thank all our speakers, yesterday's and today's. Uh, very rich talks. Uh, they were all recorded. And if everything goes right, we are going to be able to publish this material, not only for us to revisit them, to even enjoy their content better, but also because as of them, as we systematize debate, um, a debate that was so uh, well put by our speakers, we can move on in our reflection. I thank you so much for attending, for being here face to face and with us online. You had beautiful discipline. I love discipline. I like it. Yesterday was a hard day. Today, a bit easier. But our face-to-face -face and online participants, well, not only because of their discipline, of course, I'm just joking, but for their contribution, for their engagement, for their sharing of their afflictions, and also for their certainties, because we do have many certainties, should be thanked. And finally, I would like to thank the political parties of the Sao Paulo Forum. We met uh, last weekend. Again, excellent deep debate, lots of work to prepare for the year of 2019. And guests from the executive secretariat stayed here and uh, joined us in this debate. 
So many things were commented here. We talked about democracy and its complexities. Uh, in today's panel, we explored this topic a lot. Uh, we talked about uh, human rights, political, civil, social rights. Maria do Rosario yesterday and Tayana uh, 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 put it very well. That is how human resources, and when you're talking about social, political, and environmental resources, uh, are connected to these necessary reflections that must be conducted for us that want a democracy and a fairer world. And finally, this new phase of globalization and new liberal liberalism, quote unquote, that is authority, which will also require deep reflection from us, especially from us in Latin America and the Caribbean, that uh, uh, before uh, financial globalization were able to build along our populist governments some important regional interactions. Today, Europe is rethinking its bet of regional integration. But here in Brazil, it was something we invested in, in Brazil and Latin America. But this is also something that uh, is uh, food for thought before the hegemonization of financial capital, which was also addressed here. So many topics that were uh, mentioned, uh, many that I couldn't even mention here, but we have uh, material for several conferences held by Perseu Albano Foundation, but also by many other friends here in Brazil, in Latin America and Europe. So finally, I'd like to thank you. It was a pleasure. It was hard working, but it was worth it. And despite such difficult year for us, uh, with so many turmoils in Brazil and Latin America, I have the impression we are closing the year, and I hope we are closing it uh, at a high note. Lola Livre.